Hi, my name is Phil. Before the introduction of list patterns, you would write code something like the following. It looks a little bit gnarly. You have to think quite hard to trace through and understand the full logic flow here. So instead, let's rewrite this using list patterns to end up with a much shorter version. Our new version, which implements exactly the same logic, is a masterpiece in readability. It highlights the power of list patterns and why you should be using them more. Shorter code, easier to reason about, and less likely to have bugs because it's just simpler. So give me just a few minutes and I'll teach you everything you need to know about list patterns. Our example is going to take a list of numbers as an array, and then we'll develop some patterns and introduce more and more complexity as we go along. First up, we're gonna match against a list of length zero. So we just have open and close brackets with nothing inside it. So this matches against an empty list. Let's do something a bit more interesting. So let's match against a list with one entry. And that one entry has to have the number one as its matching value. Pretty simple again. Now we don't have to match against one, we can match against any number of entries. So here we're gonna match against one, two, and three in that order. And of course you can carry on this pattern and match against five, 10, 20 entries if you want to. To match any value, use the discard pattern, which is the underscore. Here you can see we are matching against any value for the first element and then two and three integers for the next two. And here's another example where we use discard for all three values. In this case, we're gonna match only against an array which is exactly three in length, but we don't care what the values are for those three positions. Matching against a single value is quite restrictive. Luckily, we have relational patterns. So here we're gonna see that we match the first element if it's greater than four. We can also expand that. So you can also have greater than equal, less than equal or less than, for example here, greater than four for the first element, greater than or equal to five for the second, and so forth. This opens up far more possibilities. We can introduce logical operators in order to really expand this and have ranges of values. Here's an example. We can say greater than zero and less than 10. So this will match anything between one and nine inclusive. We can also introduce the not operator. So we can say not eight, so that's everything except the value eight. And finally, we can use the OR operator. So here we can see we don't care about the value of the first value in the array because we've said underscore, and then we've said the second element in the array must be one, two, or three. And so you can see quite a lot of power here as you combine them together to get quite a complex set of ranges for matching. Sometimes you don't know exactly how many elements are going to be in the array. And this is where the two dots operator comes in. Here's an example. We're saying that the first element must be the number four, and then we're saying we don't care what the rest of the elements are. There could be zero, one, 10, a thousand elements that follow, it doesn't matter. So this will match an array with one entry or two or as many as you like, as long as the first is equal to four. Now you can also put this double dots at the start. For example, here we're saying we can have as many elements as we like, as long as the last element is a five. So the length of the array must be at least one element, but it could be as many as you like. A third possibility is to put it in the middle. So here we go, the first element must be six. You can have as many as you like in the middle, including zero, and then at the end, the last element must also be six. Now remember, you can only use the double dots once. The start at the end in the middle, but you can't use it in more than one place. Now we can go a step further and make this much more powerful. Here's an example. The first element has to be the number seven. The middle, we're saying zero or more elements, and it's gonna give us back a variable, in this case called mill, which is an array of the middle elements. So this means, as you can see on the right-hand side, we can take this middle array, in this case, we're just gonna get the length and convert it to a string, but you can do any kind of processing you like with it. So this allows us to extract the array section, which is in the middle here, but it could be the start or the end and do some sort of processing with it. This is really powerful. It's not just the middle spread array that you can get a variable for. Here's an example where we take the first element must be eight. We can then say, I want a variable for the second element. In this case, it's gonna be an integer always. So we say int a, int b for the next one and so forth. 
And so we can get variables for any of the elements and then do processing with them. In this case, we're just going to add two numbers together. But you can use this as a powerful way to extract values, perform calculations, return it, etc. And finally, the last pattern I'm going to show here is just an underscore, which is the discard pattern. We've seen it inside the list array, but you can also use it on its own to say, look, anything that defaults, anything else that doesn't match, let's match it here at the end of our switch statement. To demonstrate a couple more options for list patterns, I'm going to switch to a method that takes an array of objects instead of integers. So if we look in here, we're going to have a list pattern that takes a type. So here we have a list that will match a single element, and that element must be an integer. If it's not an integer, it won't match. And it doesn't have to be just an integer. Here's another example where we say if the first element's a string. We can also use the property pattern. Here's an example. We expect the first element to be a date time. And if it's a date time, we also expect the date time to have a day of week property, which is equal to Monday. Pretty cool. We can also expand this even further. Here's the same thing again. This time we're checking day of week is equal to Tuesday. And we've declared a variable dt as the output. This allows us to take that date time and do something with it. In this case, we're just going to convert it to a, a short date string. But you could do anything you want with it, anything pretty complicated. You can use the list pattern all over the place. It's not restricted to just the switch expression that I've shown so far. So here you can see I've used it in the if statement. You can use it in a switch where you would normally have case. You can put your list pattern in there. You could even use it in line. Wherever you would return a Boolean, just use an is with a list pattern. So it's really powerful and it can be used all over the place. Hopefully I've convinced you to use list patterns the next time we do C Sharp. Subscribe to my channel, hit the like button, and I will see you next time. Be awesome.